overall debate about the budget. So, Madam President, I'll, I'll uh, conclude there, but uh, again reiterate that uh, I hope the House will take up uh, the bill that can end this crisis and open up the government. And with that, Madam President, I would yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. So the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Well, work continues behind the scenes on an answer to the shutdown of the federal government. <clears throat> now in uh, day two, excuse me, the House is uh, taking up three targeted piecemeal funding bills this afternoon, providing temporary government funding for the Department of Veterans Affairs, National Parks and Museums, and the District of Columbia. These same three bills failed to get the needed support and were voted down yesterday in the House. The members will get another shot at it today through a different way of introducing the bills. Majority Leader Harry Reid has already suggested that these bills will not be approved here in the Senate. Also, the White House has issued a statement rejecting this approach to government funding. This strategy by Republicans could change today as we are now hearing that President Obama has invited congressional leaders to a meeting today at the White House, according to a White House official. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, House Speaker John Boehner, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi have all been invited to attend. During the meeting, the president's expected to call on the House to pass the clean CR to reopen the government and call on Congress to act to raise the debt ceiling to pay the bills we have already incurred and avoid devastating consequences to our economy, quote unquote. Well, we continue to get your input on the impact of the shutdown. We will show you some of those remarks and uh, feel free to tweet us at C-SPAN chat. Also, just a, a real quick note, C-SPAN remains on the air despite the government shutdown because we do not receive government funding. C-SPAN is funded by the cable and satellite companies. Majority Leader Harry Reid has uh, just finished up a news briefing on the status of the federal shutdown. Here is the latest from the Senate side. It should be going up now, not down. My clock. It was so disappointed in what happened that it shut down. I just finished a telephonic conversation with Speaker Boehner. My message to him was very simple. We have to stop playing these foolish games that keep coming to us from the other side of the Capitol. This is not about him or me, about scoring points for one side or the other, name-calling, like the villain of villains. It's about doing the right thing for the American people. They expect us to act like adults. We actually work for the American people. They sent us here to get things done, not to play these silly games. So here's what I propose. He's sitting on a bill that would reopen the government right now. This bill would pass in a matter of minutes if he just let Democrats and Republicans vote. He doesn't have to, he doesn't even have to vote for it. Let him vote against it, but let the House work its will. Once we reopen government, I propose a House Senate appoint conferees to work out the nation's long term fiscal challenges. Both sides have priority, priorities that we want to move forward. So let's sit down and talk. That's how negotiations should work. Remember, this is out of the blue. They said they wanted a conference. So let me read just a part of the letter that I sent him uh, an hour or so ago. Now we find ourselves at loggerheads. There needs to be a path forward to reopen government and protect our economy. This is a communication to you offering a sensible, reasonable compromise. Before the House, you have Senate passed major reopen government, funded at the level the House chose in its own legislation. I propose you allow the joint resolution to pass reopening government, and I commit to name conferees to a budget conference as soon as the government opens. That conference can discuss the important fiscal issues facing our nation. You and your colleagues have repeatedly cited these fiscal issues as things on which you need to work. This conference would be an appropriate place to have those discussions where participants could raise whatever proposals, such as tax reform, health care, agriculture, and certainly discretionary spending like veterans, national parks, NIH, they, feel, they, felt, they felt appropriate. Hope that we can work together in this fashion. Together we can end this government shutdown, work to address important fiscal issues facing our nation. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Um, he can characterize the conversation between the two of us, but it was um, a cordial conversation. Senator Durbin. Thanks, Senator Reid. An hour ago, I was down at the World War II Memorial. An honor flight came in today from Illinois. It was a lot of fun uh, meeting these World War II vets. 
um, all men who had served our nation and risked their lives to keep America free. For some of them, it's the last trip they'll ever make, and you can tell it. But they wanted to be here, and I'm glad they were. What did they want to talk about? They wanted to talk about the government shutdown. Over and over again, they said to me, when are you going to get this government up and running again? And I think about that. Men who risked their lives decades ago, who can't understand what's going on today in Washington. Well, it is hard to explain. It's hard to explain how we've shut down the government in a manufactured political crisis. The impact, well, each day we come up with new examples. The examples I brought to the floor and others have too from the National Institutes of Health are heartbreaking. 200 people turned down for clinical trials at the National Institutes of Health because of the government shutdown, including 30 children. An unfortunate position of a partial government shutdown. Uh, following a veto threat from the president last night, uh, Democrats in the House of Representatives killed three spending bills that would have funded parks and monuments, veterans programs, and the D.C. government. Senate Democrats have already rejected four House passed proposals that would have provided Americans with relief from Obamacare while ensuring that government operations continued. Senate Democrats even rejected one proposal that would have sent the two chambers to conference, the House and the Senate to conference, uh, to work out some sort of a solution uh, to the standoff that we find ourselves in. But they haven't even been willing to talk. In fact, uh, when that proposal, that request from the House came to the Senate to create a conference that would allow uh, the House and the Senate to come together and try and find a solution, uh, it was tabled. It was soundly rejected, tabled, uh, by the Democrats here in the United States Senate. And so we're continuing in this uh, holding pattern as uh, the House continues to send proposals over and they continue to be rejected by the Senate, but then the Senate Democrats don't want to even sit down and talk uh, with the House about how we might resolve this. Now, I'm happy to hear that the President has, after a week of essentially ignoring uh, congressional Republicans, called the leaders to the White House tonight. I'm a little confused, however, about the purpose of the meeting as the White House continues to say that they're not going to negotiate. I hope the President does change his mind on that, that he's uh, evolving on this, and that he'll express a willingness to work with Republicans at this meeting. Because it really is important for the President to be engaged in this process. So you can't imagine a scenario where you've got uh, consequences like this with a continuing resolution, a funding resolution, um, still not approved, partial government shutdown, uh, debt limit coming up here at the middle of the month, and the President of the United States essentially saying, I'm not going to negotiate. I'm just not going to negotiate uh, on any of this. I think that is a position that's completely unreasonable, and I think the American people find it to be completely unreasonable as well. In the meantime, we have an opportunity now to address some of the concerns that have been raised uh, by people about various uh, parts of our government that as a result of this unnecessary shutdown, uh, are not open. And so Republicans continue to try and work to open government and at the same time to provide Obamacare fairness for all. And, you know, I've said this before, Madam President, but I, I get the sense that some of our colleagues on the Democrat side, the President, seem to be content with shutting down the government. Well, we Republicans are not. We are consistently trying to come up with solutions. And again, to the House of Representatives will be meeting today, and they're going to be voting again on some of the same proposals that were voted down last, week, or last night by House Democrats that are common sense spending bills that would ensure that important functions of government can resume. These bills would ensure that benefits for our nation's veterans continue uninterrupted. They would allow our members of the National Guard and Reserve to be paid provide funding for the National Institutes of Health to ensure that this senseless shutdown does not prevent patients from receiving life-saving treatments. And I'm just going to explain very briefly, uh, Madam President, what some of these bills would do. And they're going to be coming over later today from the House of Representatives to the Senate, where, at least to date, uh, none of the proposals that have been advanced by the House of Representatives have been accepted here in the Senate. They've been tabled uh, by the majority leader, and, um, which is unfortunate because it's the essence of, I think, what the American people believe we ought to be doing, and that is working together, coming together to find a solution to some of these big problems. Unfortunately, as I said before, when the request came over to go to conference with the House, that was tabled as well. So there's been no discussion, no willing to, 
talk, no, no, no willingness to talk, no willingness to, to uh, try and cooperate in a way that would uh, help us uh, get government, fundamental uh, operations of government uh, up and running again. But anyway, the, the, the bills are going to come over from the House today, follow uh, the same, as I said, track that they, they uh, tried to get approved last night. One deals with the availability uh, through the annual appropriations process for the Department of Veterans Affairs to continue to serve veterans, namely veterans disability payments, the GI Bill, education training, VA home loans, uh, all under the same conditions that were in effect at the end of the just completed fiscal year. So in other words, it would take all those programs that benefit veterans, make sure that they continue uninterrupted, funded just as they were at the end of the fiscal year until such time as Congress can come up with a more, a longer term solution whether that's a, an appropriation bill, which frankly should have been passed much earlier this year and wasn't, because none of the appropriation bills actually were moved here in the United States Senate, or another temporary funding uh, measure like a continuing resolution is, uh, is put forward. But there are, uh, that is a proposal that, uh, similar proposal I should say, was introduced by a number of Senate Democrats. So when it comes over from the House of Representatives today, I hope that we will have broad bipartisan support in the United States Senate for making sure that veterans programs are continued and are funded. There's also going to be a bill that comes over that deals with uh, national parks and museums and it would provide immediate funding for the National Park Service operations, the Smithsonian, the National Gallery of Art, and the National United States Holocaust Museum at the same rate and under the same conditions as in effect at the end of the just completed fiscal year. So essentially uh, same thing I mentioned with regard to veterans programs, uh, these uh, functions of government would be funded at the same level as they were at the year we just completed until such time again as an appropriations bill is passed or a temporary funding measure uh, is put in place. And so that was something that the House voted on yesterday. It was defeated. Uh, again, House Democrats not, not, I shouldn't say it was universally, but almost so, uh, voted against that measure when it was brought up yesterday. Hopefully today they'll get a different outcome in the House. I think they will, and it will come over here to the Senate. Uh, another bill that the House will move today will provide for the immediate availability of local funds, uh, which are subject to the control of Congress through the annual pro appropriations process for the District of Columbia. Again, under the same conditions as in effect at the end of the just completed fiscal year. And then finally, um, there will be a bill that comes over from the House, provides funding for the pay and allowances uh, of military personnel and the reserve component who are in inactive status. So it will fund the um, Guard and Reserve. Uh, and those funds, again, would be made available at the same level as the just completed fiscal year and uh, until such time as Congress takes uh, more formal action. And then uh, finally, the, um, the other thing that it will do, there will be another bill coming from the House, a, a fifth bill, that will provide immediate funding for the National Institutes of Health at the same rate and under the same conditions as in, a, in effect at the end of the just completed fiscal year. So the national, the important work that's done by the National uh, Institutes of Health uh, will continue if the bill is enacted here by the Senate to go on uh, even in the midst of a partial, partial shutdown. I guess what I'm saying, Madam President, is Republicans are trying uh, to, to address all of these uh, concerns that we have about various elements of our government that are not functioning today because of this partial shutdown. And um, last night, we were met with resistance in the House of Representatives. Those were voted down by Democrats. We are hoping for a different outcome today. I think we will have a different outcome today in the House of Representatives, at which point those bills will come here to the Senate. So if the Senate is interested in going on the record and making sure that there is funding available, available for veterans programs, for uh, the museums and for our, our monuments and that sort of thing, for our Guard and Reserve, for the National Institutes of Health, and for the District of Columbia, Columbia which is under the jurisdiction of the Congress when it comes to funding, the Senate will, should vote affirmatively and uh, actually ensure that, um, that those important functions of our government are addressed and are funded. And so, Madam President, I guess what I'm simply saying here today is that uh, time and time and time again now, the House of Representatives has sent to the Senate uh, legislation, measures that would continue to fund the government, and in, in earlier cases as they came over here, address what I think the American people have said they want to see addressed in Obamacare. And, um, you know, we've talked a lot about this, but the President of the United States has granted 
a delay, a one-year delay to employers in this country from the employer mandate. So essentially he gave a delay, a waiver if you will, to big business. Uh, what the House of Representatives in one of the bills that they sent the Senate simply said was, we ought to in fairness give the same break to individuals. There is an individual mandate in the uh, Obamacare law that kicks in and that we ought to be able to give individuals in this country the same treatment that we give to big businesses. And so as a matter of fairness, uh, that was proposed by the House of Representatives. And the, the, when that bill came over, it also included a provision that would ensure that members of Congress and their staffs and the staffs of the President's office and the executive branch of the government are all subject to the same laws, same provisions, the laws applied in the same way, the Obamacare law, as are other Americans. And so you had a one-year um, delay, temporary relief from the individual mandate included in that, and a provision that, that ensured that those of us up here and our staffs and members of the executive branch are treated the same way as our other Americans. That too was tabled here in the United States Senate. And it strikes me at least that as we think about the impact of this law, we ought to ensure that middle class Americans deserve the same relief that the President and that uh, Democrats here in the Senate have already given to members of Congress and to their staffs as well as to big businesses in this country. Now, we had an opportunity to do that uh, the other night. That was rejected by the Senate. And I think that every, the question that every American ought to be asking is why, uh, why would you not here in the United States Senate, why won't Democrat senators uh, give the same break to the American people that big businesses have received? And I would argue again, Madam President, it's an issue of basic fairness. We think it ought to be delayed for all Americans, not just for the favored few. Now, there is a bipartisan support for this. I've mentioned before that uh, we have a Democrat senator here in the United States Senate who has said that a delay in the individual mandate is a very reasonable and sensible approach. Um, I would hope that at some point that view will, will start to spread to others and we'll be able to actually provide some relief to the American people from the harmful effects of Obamacare. Um, but in, at least while we're in this period as, as this continues to be discussed and hopefully eventually a solution reached, we ought to be protecting those Americans who are being hit by uh, the shutdown. And so when these bills come over from the House of Representatives today, I hope that the Senate will pick them up very quickly and act on them. Uh, we had a, an example or an incident yesterday where a number of uh, World War II veterans came here to Washington, D.C., uh, Honor Flight guests, so that's a, an organization that brings uh, veterans here, World War II veterans, here to see their monument, the World War II uh, monument here, a memorial here in Washington, and couldn't get access to it because of the shutdown. Uh, that should be unacceptable to every American. And we need to ensure that that never happens again. There was even reporting, Madam President, that they had made a request of the administration to be able to go there and that they were turned down. Now, I can't imagine turning down a group of World War II veterans who simply wanted to see and have access to uh, the very memorial uh, for which they fought and defended our country. And so those are the types of things that uh, action taken by the Senate here could prevent if, uh, if, in fact, when these bills come over from the House of Representatives, the Senate will act in, a, in an expeditious way, uh, pick those bills up and pass them. We can ensure that people have access to those types of uh, to the monuments, the memorials. We can ensure that veterans programs continue to be funded and operational. Uh, we can ensure that the National Institutes of Health and the important work that it does continues. We can ensure that our National Guard and Reserve uh, also are, are funded uh, through this time. And uh, it strikes me, at least, that that's a very common sense way to approach uh, the situation in which we find ourselves today. Uh, I would hope that uh, at the end of the day that we can come to some resolution that would allow the government to be funded on a more sustainable basis. I think when we continue to do these things on a short-term basis, it's not, a, it's not a good way to govern a country as large as ours. Uh, we can do better. The American people deserve better. But we at least at a minimum, until we get that broader issue resolved, uh, we ought to resolve that we're going to ensure that veterans and, and members of the Guard and Reserve, um, people who are visiting our country want to see the memorials, the museums, and that sort of thing, have the opportunity to do that. We can do that today uh, by picking up and passing the bills when they come over from the House of Representatives. Madam President, I yield the floor.
Madam President. The Senator from Maryland. Uh, Madam President, let me uh, sort of review where we are, because I'm listening to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, talk about the effects of a government shutdown. And I will admit uh, I'm pretty sensitive about this. In my state of Maryland that I have the honor of representing is home to 286,000 federal workers, about 124,000 on furlough today. We have uh, 172,000 federal workers who work in the state of Maryland. So I'm very much aware of what the consequences of this government shutdown has been to our, to our local economy. But let, let me just sort of review where we are, because I'm one who wants to get together. I want to get government open as quickly as possible. I hope we can reach an agreement and move forward and pay our bills and get rid of sequestration and get a budget that makes sense. But let me just review where, how we got to this point because it's been six months uh, since the Senate passed a budget. That's the blueprint for our committees to work. The House passed a budget, which was different than the Senate budget. And then it was important for both sides to negotiate well before October 1 to get a budget we could agree on so we could pass the appropriation bills. But one party, and one party alone, refused to meet. That was the Republican Party. They refused to meet. Then we got to October 1. And this is not the first time in American history that Congress hasn't been able to pass uh, appropriation bills by October 1. It happens too frequently. But what we do, if we can't reach agreement, we keep government open while we continue at last year's funding level. That's called a continuing resolution. And that's what this body did. We passed a continuing resolution so the government would stay open at the funding level that the Republicans wanted, because we didn't want to get into that fight uh, as, uh, because of uh, the importance of keeping government uh, open. And then we had the votes to pass that. We passed it here. We had the votes in the other body. But for one person, the Speaker of the House, not bringing that up for a vote, in the House of Representatives, where we would have had a bipartisan majority, government shut down midnight on September the 30th. Now, let me, if I might, I want to quote from the Baltimore Sun Papers. It was this morning's editorial. Because I know what I say sometimes, people say it was a Democrat speaking or a Republican speaking. So let me just read from the Baltimore Sun today what they said about the negotiations. And I quote, it would be tempting, of course, to write that this impasse, the inability to agree on a continuing resolution to fund government past the end of the fiscal year, was the fault of Democrats and Republicans alike. But that would be like blaming the hostages for causing the perpetrator to put a gun to their heads. As President Barack Obama noted, he and congressional Democrats put forward no agenda other than keeping the government operating temporarily at current levels. House Republicans set conditions, not Senate Democrats. And it's not even clear how many in the GOP truly wanted this to happen. Conventional wisdom is that the so-called clean resolution, funding government, would have passed on a bipartisan vote if it had been allowed on the floor by House Speaker John Boehner. The editorial goes on, and I continue to quote, do House leaders think they can push the blame on President Obama? Some have already tried, but it sounds suspiciously like shoplifters blaming store owners for having so much tempting merchandise lying about. National polls show the public isn't buying it. Most Americans didn't want the government to shudder over Obamacare. And congressional Republicans have a double-digit lead over the White House when it comes to the public's choice for who most deserves the most blame. Even the unusual anti-government crowd can't find much comfort in this, as sending federal workers home isn't saving anybody any money. The last time the federal government had an extended shutdown for 21 days in late 1995 to early 1996, it cost something on the order of $2 billion. 
What an extraordinary waste of money, particularly at a time when conservatives claim to be worried about the deficit. End quote. So, Madam President, it's hard to negotiate when one side has put on the table what is where we should be, allowing government to stay open, using last year's numbers, and the other side brings in issues that are totally unrelated to the continuation of government. Having said that, we've got to find a way. We've got to find a way to get government open. I'm, I'm pleased the President's meeting with the leaders this afternoon. Uh, I'm pleased they're also talking about making sure we pay our bills, which is at jeopardy in just two weeks. I mentioned earlier that uh, I'm a little sensitive about this because of the impact it has on the economy of my state. It has an impact on the entire country. The entire country is, 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 is going to hurt. In my state, it's $15 million a day in revenue that we lose directly as a result of the government shutdown. It's been an estimate by Moody's uh, Brian Kessler that the, if the shutdown went three to four weeks, uh, it would cost our economy $55 billion. This is no small impact on our economy. It's a major impact on our economy. It's not just the federal workers who aren't going to get paychecks. It's the shop owners who depend upon business that's going to be cut back. It's contractors who depend upon the, the contracts being honored by the, the federal government. And the list goes on and on and on, the impact it has on our economy. And as I quoted from the, uh, some papers, the taxpayers will pick up the tab. They're not going to save any money. They're going to, it's going to cost them money, big time, not a few bucks. It's going to cost a lot of money uh, once we get back. And every day we wait, it costs the taxpayers of this country more money. So those of us who are interested in dealing with the deficit, keep government operating. It's a huge waste of resources to shut down the government. Now, we're going to lose some, some vital services. Um, the, 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 earlier today, I, I held a, a, a conference with Senator Mikulski, Senator Warner, and Senator Boxer, where we went over some of the real impacts that occur. And we were joined by federal workers, Madam President, that wanted to be at work doing their, their, their service to this country, but because of the government shutdown, they were furloughed workers. Now, this isn't the first attack against federal workers that we've seen. You know, we've seen uh, in the last couple of years freezes on their budgets. We've seen them furloughed as a result of sequestration. We've seen freezes on hiring, so they're asked to do more with less. We have less federal workers per capita in modern history asked to do more work. So, so let me just relay some of the stories, some of the accounts by the people that came to Washington today so that their story can be told. Marcelo Del, Del Canto works for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. He works in Rockville. He lives in Poolsville, Maryland. He's been a federal employee for eight years. He does vital work to help prevent substance abuse. He has work on his desk that he could do today to help keep people healthier. Instead, he is furloughed sitting at home, can't go into work. We heard from Amy Fritz, a meteorologist and physical oceanographer at the National Weather Service. Uh, he, she works in Silver Springs, Maryland. I've been there. I've been, this is the agency that tracks the storms. Thank goodness we had reliable information about Hurricane Sandy. That work was done not on the Weather Channel, it was done by federal and public servants. Amy has a double degree. She's a national expert in this area. You know what she said today? How do I know we shouldn't be tracking a storm right now, getting additional information to keep our country safe? That's what's at stake here. People that are here, we've seen incredible weather episodes of late. Every person should be on board doing their work. Noah had to let, uh, with furlough, same as a layoff, 55% of their workforce, 6,633 employees furloughed as a result of the government shutdown. We heard from Carter Kimsey. She works for the National Science Foundation. She's been there since 1976. 
She works with young people, getting them involved in science, giving the basic research that's critically important for economic growth and, and this country's competitiveness. She tells us that she has work on her desk that's critically important to young people continuing in science. She can't work today because of the government shutdown. That's going to affect America's competitiveness. We're going to lose scientists. We're going to lose a great deal as a result of government being shut down. Heard from Steve Hopkins, the Office of Pesticide Programs at the Environmental Protection Agency. EPA had to furlough 94% of their workers. 15,181 workers furloughed at EPA. So what is he not doing today that he could have been doing? Helping keeping our environment safe for the overuse of pesticides? Making it a little bit safer for our children as they breathe the air and drink the water of this country? That's what's at jeopardy here. Now, I can tell you about their individual stories. When, when I talked to Marcel DeCanto, he just told me he just recently purchased a home in Polesville, Maryland. We're happy about that. But he has a mortgage payment. So I asked about, he's married, how's your spouse doing? She's also furloughed. How are they going to pay their mortgage payment? It was interesting, the story that, that uh, was told to us by Carter Kimsey. She was telling us the ethics that they use in scientific experiments. And they talk about how they treat the animals they use. And they say, you know, we make sure they get it, the, 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 the resources necessary. They're, they're fed. They're taken care of. Well, how about our federal workers? Shouldn't they have their paycheck to pay their food bills? This is outrageous as far as being wasteful, as far as being against economic growth in this country, but it's also wrong. It's wrong to the people who have been victimized by this, who don't know if they're going to get a paycheck. We've got people working, they don't know if they're getting paid. We've got people who aren't working, don't know if they're going to get the money to pay their bills. Where's the empathy here for what you're doing? This is outrageous. My colleagues already talked about the National Institutes of Health, located in Maryland. 73% of their employees furloughed. You know what they do? Just the most incredible research in the world so we can stay healthy. We can find out the mysteries of incredible diseases. They're working on a vaccine now to deal with influenza, save millions of lives. And what do we do? We tell them to go home and not work? This is not a game. We're affecting people's lives by what we're doing here. 200 people, patients, will be denied care this week at NIH as a result of the sh shutdown. Who knows whether one of those individuals, whether, whether it makes it life or death. That's what's involved. The FDA, 45% of their employees furloughed. They won't be able to conduct the inspections, the compliance and enforcement of our food laws, our safety laws. Department of Interior, 81% of their employees furloughed. What an embarrassment. I was talking to a reporter from another country. What an embarrassment. The iconic national parks of America closed. But it also affects the businesses around all those parks, as well as inconveniencing the public. Small Business Administration, two-thirds of their employees furloughed. It's about you're a small business person, depending on a loan. You don't have the officer there to process that loan. What do you do? Madam President, the list goes on and on. I go through every agency. There's only one answer to this. Keep government open. Not one agency, two agencies, three agencies. Keep every agency open. That's the responsible thing for us to do. We should do that. We should make sure we pay our bills. And yes, we should negotiate a balanced way to move forward with a budget. I've been talking on the floor many times about that. And there's a give and take that we have to make on the budget moving forward. We've got to balance our books. 
We need the revenues necessary to do it. We've got to look at all spending, not just discretionary domestic spending. We've got to look at all spending. And we need to do that in a bipartisan manner because guess what? The Republicans don't control the House and Senate and the White House. And the Democrats don't control the House. So the public expects us to work together on a budget. That's not what this debate's about. This debate is whether we're going to keep government open, whether we're going to pay our bills. And we must do that for the sake of the people of this country. I just want to mention one other issue. I filed yesterday legislation with many of my colleagues to make it clear to those federal workers who are furloughed, we're going to fight to do what we did in the 1990s when we went on a furlough, when we went on government shutdown, and pay all federal workers. They're innocent. They should be made whole. My legislation, co-sponsored by many of our colleagues, we have bipartisan support in the House of Representatives, that we get that bill passed to make sure that every federal worker is held whole as a result of this shutdown. It's not their fault. With that, Madam President, I would yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Ayotte. So general speeches continue on the floor of the Senate. We uh, were told at the beginning of the session that uh, Majority Leader Harry Reid would begin a, um, a period where he would be recognized beginning at 2 p.m. Eastern 
to uh, update on the status of negotiations to end the government shutdown. So that'll be in about 15 minutes or so. The House is proceeding with its own strategy, taking up five targeted piecemeal funding bills that would provide temporary government funding for the Department of Veterans Affairs, National Parks and Museums, and the District of Columbia, adding today funding for the National Institutes of Health and pay for military reservists for inactive duty training. Three of those bills failed to get the needed support in the House yesterday, and House leadership is working to bring those bills to the floor again today for votes. The likelihood of those measures getting Senate approval is slim, according to Majority Leader Harry Reid. The Majority Leader, by the way, sent a letter to House Speaker John Boehner urging the House to approve the Senate's bill to reopen the government. And in response, Speaker Boehner said in part, the entire government is shut down right now because Washington Democrats refuse to even talk about fairness for all Americans under Obamacare. Offering to negotiate only after Democrats get everything they want is not much of an offer. Today, the House will continue to pass bills that reflect the American people's priorities. The Senate passed the troop funding bill this weekend. Will they now say no to funding for veterans, our national parks, and the National Institutes of Health? Well, we could see progress on stemming the showdown this afternoon. President Obama has invited a bipartisan group of congressional leaders to a meeting today at the White House. And according to that's according to a White House official. That is uh, set to get underway at about 5.30 Eastern. If there are any reports of progress, we will have it for you here on the C-SPAN networks. Also, we continue to get your input on the impact of the shutdown. Throughout the day, we will show you some of those remarks. You can feel free to tweet us at uh, the hashtag C-SPAN chat. As this quorum call continues, we'll show you a discussion now on the government shutdown from this morning's Washington Journal. Joined now by Representative Jim Himes, a Democrat from Connecticut. Congressman, thank you for joining us. Good morning, Juana. So now we're, we're in day two of shutdown. Tell me the truth. How long do you think this is going to go on? Well, you know, I was asking a bunch of people last night what they thought. You know, guesses ranged from a week to two weeks, maybe on the outside three weeks. Uh, you know, obviously shorter would be better in this case. But, uh, you know, who, who knows? Look, we've got a very intransigent group of people led by Ted Cruz in the Senate, and these guys are, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're standing by their guns. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people paying a price for that. What are the biggest roadblocks? You mentioned Senator Ted Cruz, but what are the other roadblocks to finding some kind of an accord? Well, you know, it's a, it's a, this is what's most frustrating about it, right? This, this, this Republican shutdown is actually be dispensed with. Without objection. Madam President, I yes unanimous consent that morning business be extended until 5 p.m. and that all provisions of the previous order remain in effect and that Senator Reid be recognized following morning business and that all time spent in quorum calls be equally divided. Without objection. I suggest the absence of quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Uh, could stand up to those 30 or 40 people, sort of symbolized by Ted Cruz in the Senate. We'd get a deal on the floor this morning that would allow the government to reopen. And by the way, probably one that would get us past the debt ceiling and solve a lot of other problems as well. Several reports out this morning, including some in Politico, suggest that this fight over the government shutdown could go as far to the debt ceiling, that October 17th deadline. How likely do you think that is, and what is the cost if that happens? Well, um, I actually think it's somewhat likely. And, um, you know, and, in, and it, by the way, uh, you know, the government shutdown, of course, is an inconvenience. It's painful to a lot of people, government contractors. We got the story of the World War II vets, you know, who had trouble at the World War II memorial. But... The prospect of a, of, a, of a default, of the world waking up and saying, hey, the United States Treasury is not going to service its debts, that is a catastrophe with a capital C. And so if we can get a deal done, remember, this all comes down to when John Boehner, and I don't say this with any animosity, I actually have a lot of respect for Speaker Boehner, when he decides that he's finally going to stand up to that 30 or 40 people, the Tea Party extremists in his caucus, and say, no, we are not going to trash the full faith and credit of the United States government. So it might be easier to fold both things into one deal, do the deal the way we've done anything we've done in the House, which is some Democrats, some Republicans, and we move on. Um, but, uh, you know, this is what really worries me. Playing around with the possibility of a default is a devastating thing. And what kind of signals, if there is a default, would that send to creditors both here as well as around the world? Well, here we have an economic recovery that is, um, that is weak. Uh, you know, it's growing. We're adding 200,000 uh, jobs a, a, a month. You know, we're growing at 2% GDP. That's not good enough. Um, 
defaulting on the full faith and credit of the United States, it, you know, it's, it's not just, gosh, what would that mean for Social Security checks that wouldn't go out or Medicare payments that wouldn't get made or, you know, defense spending that wouldn't happen. The entire global economy, every business, every asset, a share of stock, a, you know, real estate, it is all valued under the assumption that the United States government is risk-free. This is the word that business people use, risk-free. And if a week from now somebody says maybe we ought to default on the debt, all of a sudden the capital markets are going to wake up and say, wait a second, maybe it's not risk-free. And when that happens, all hell breaks loose, and, and, and that cannot be allowed to happen. And by the way, look, again, it's, that's not a congressional Democrat speaking. That is the United States Chamber of Commerce. That is probably every CEO in the United States of America today who actually has to run a business. So this is serious stuff. You mentioned CEOs. A number of them are meeting today with President Barack Obama. What should he say to them to give them faith that this, there's a resolution to this, or what should his message be? I think what his message to the CEOs uh, should be, you have a profound stake uh, in the stability of our economy. Uh, your companies are valuable. They are growing because the economy is recovering, not as strongly as we would like. Uh, and you employ thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And he should say to them, it's not me who is saying we will mess around with the full faith and credit of the United States government. Uh, it is a small band of people on Capitol Hill, many of whom listen to you, business community. Business community often has a voice with the Republican Party. Go tell those folks that they are on a very, very dangerous path. Um, we would love to take your calls. For Democrats, the number is 202-585-3880. For Republicans, the number is 202-585-3881 and independent. What is the pending business before the Senate? The Senate is in a quorum call. I ask unanimous consent that the call of the quorum be vacated. Without objection. Madam President, I wish to speak as if in morning business and consume such time as necessary. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. Well, I think we're growing weary. I think we're growing weary of the grid gawk, dead gawk, hammer gawk uh, on our government. I think we're growing weary of the partisan posturing uh, by one faction in one party in one house. The American people want us to reopen government so that government should be meeting the national security needs of the United States, protecting the, pub the safety of the people of the United States, meeting compelling human needs, and doing what we can to create jobs today, like in physical infrastructure, and laying the groundwork for jobs tomorrow, investing in research and development. The American people want a government that works as hard as they do, and so do I. Instead of working hard to serve our veterans or our elderly or promoting a growing economy, here we are in the shutdown of the government. Now, the House is going through sending us bills that on the first blush seem attractive. I mean, who doesn't support our National Guard? Who doesn't want to fund NIH? I certainly do. NIH is located in my state. I'm so proud of the fact that the, the men and women who work there and also the funding that goes to great state universities doing research, like the University of Wisconsin, that they're out there doing it. But we cannot cherry pick. What they're doing now is a public relations ploy. Public relations ploys. The House wants to send us cherry picked solutions to the shutdown problem. It is contrived and it is cynical. What I am asking for the House of Representatives to do is to take up the Senate bill that we sent them that is a clean, continued funding resolution. What does clean mean? It means it is stripped out of politically motivated ideological riders. And I the second thing is, it would fund government for six weeks. It would give us, in that six weeks, the chance to work out what our funding should be for the rest of the year. I would hope we'd find a way to cancel the sequester, which is to reduce public debt without reducing jobs or opportunity. 
and get us through the debt ceiling. Please, that bill is pending in the House now, and I would ask that they do that instead of sending us these piecemeal solutions. I remind my colleagues that the continuing funding resolution passed the Senate last Friday. It does keep the government, it reopens the government. It does give us the opportunity to renegotiate. We need to, I'm willing to negotiate, but we can't capitulate to these partisan demands to defund Obamacare and to do other kinds of par uh, riders that do work against us. To move forward, we need to pass the Senate continuing resolution. Now, I understand that later today that the President is meeting with Speaker Boehner, Nancy Pelosi, Majority Leader Reid, and Senator McConnell. I hope that wiser heads would now prevail and we would get a path forward to reopen all of government not cherry-picked items, many of which are desirable, absolutely desirable, but we need to open the entire federal government. So I know that what the House wants to send us over is to reopen NIH. Of course, that's what I just said. But what about then the Center for Disease Control? So we open NIH, but we don't open the Center for Disease Control. You know, it's an agency that's located in Atlanta, but it's part of our public health triad, which goes to the work of NIH, the work for the F Food and Drug Administration, which stands sentry over the safety of our food supply and the safety and efficacy of our drugs and medical devices. And then there's the Center for Disease Control. That's down in Atlanta. Right this very minute, in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Center for Disease Control, close to 9,000 people have been furloughed. Furloughed is just a nice word that means layoff, layoff. And it also means that not only are the labs in Atlanta, but it also affects labs in Colorado, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. The work of the CDC also is nationwide because they're our biosurveillance system on infectious disease. That means that state health departments, all 50 states in our territories, depend on the Centers for Disease Control to be giving them information on what is the tracking the trends related to infectious diseases. That way they can avert, uh, alert clinic clinicians, a pedi pediatricians, if there is a new kind of ear infection that could infect children. But there is no one there that can do this. Earlier this year, to give you an example, hepatitis A sickened 162 people in 10 states. CDC linked the outbreak to pomegranate seeds coming in from a foreign country in a frozen berry a mix. We were able to go right to the private sector who complied with us right away. We were able to get that off the market, contain this from spreading to other people, we're sorry, and be able to, again, working with the private sector, protect the American people. Don't we want to reopen CDC? I could go on to the fact that they, we could go over diseases after diseases, infections after infections that they won't be monitoring. Let's take a common one, flu. We all have had the sniffles, but the sniffles can also kill people. On the average, more than 200,000 Americans will be hospitalized because of flu. 3,000 Americans die from flu. Vaccines can prevent the flu. We now, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, are out, we're out there making sure there was enough vaccine available, 
that it was being distributed fairly and equitably in the United States, but also watching the infection trends, because if, if a trend was heading to one state or one locale, the public health people could work and we could be working to accelerate or expand our flu vaccine. This is what they do. And did you also know that they're de disease in detectives? Many people don't know that they're disease detectives. So what does Senator Barr mean when she says this? Sometimes there's an outbreak. People are sick. People even die. They wonder what it is. They dial 911 and it's like a disease identification SWAT team. They go in working with the best and brightest at that state level, going to use the best technology and science from our country and even around the world to identify what that is. That's how we found out about Legionnaire's disease, the hunter virus disease affecting Indian reservations. That's how we jumped in on the pomegranate seed situation. They get right in there. But you know what? Those people were furloughed. They were furloughed. What is this? So sure, do I want to reopen NIH? I absolutely do. But I want to talk about the Center for Disease Control. Let me also, I could talk about also federal, other federal employees and what shutdown means. Not only public health, but Madam President, I believe in Social Security. I really do. It's meant so much to so many people. It is one of the great earned benefits uh, in our country. The Social and I want to make sure there's no false alarm here. Social Security checks will go out. However, as of this week, for the people who work at Social Security on eligibility benefits for the elderly, disability benefits for those who are unable to work, they have been furloughed over the entire United States of America. Social Security has furloughed 18,000 people in local communities. Social Security is everywhere providing access to the American people to apply for their Social Security, apply for disability benefits, and also apply for their Medicare. 18,000 people. Now, Social Security is headquartered in Maryland. Again, this isn't because it's in Maryland. I know these workers. I know how the exams that they take to qualify to work for Social Security, whether it's the claims representatives or whether it's an actuary project, uh, predicting the trends. 18,000 people who were proud to work for Social Security, proud to do that, to make sure that one of the greatest social insurance programs ever was administered efficiently, effectively, and that the people who were eligible got what they had earned. Did you know that the overhead for running Social Security is less than 2%, lower than any private insurance company in America? Gosh. So they do it well, they do it smartly. They've been stretched because of sequester, but they are there. Right now, because of what we've been doing, we're only going to delay further these other benefits. So I want to open the doors of Social Security. When you apply, I want to be sure they're there. When you dial up, I want you to be there. That is all, by the way, coming back to NIH and what they want to send over from the House. It is in the Labor HEW HHS appropriations. That is under my very able subcommittee chairman, Senator uh, Tom Harkin. Senator Harkins worked very hard on his bills to make sure they meet compelling human need, but we do it in a way that's cost efficient. Did you know that because of parliamentary obstructionism, Senator Harkin has not been able to bring his bill to the floor since 2007? 2007, year after year, hearing after hearing, when he's wanted to bring up the funding for the Department of HHS, which these agencies are in, education, 
and also the Department of Labor that has things like mining safety in it. He can't even bring it to the floor because they won't let him or it would be filibustered. Now, while everybody over there is strutting around saying we're going to fund NIH after we shamed them into it yesterday, what they don't tell you is they can't move the labor HH bill in the House. You know why? Because they fund it at $122 billion. You know what level that is, Madam President? 2003. Not even 2012. Not even 2010. They want to fund it back to George Bush and right around the funding level of 2003. They want to take this back a decade. They want to take us back to the dark ages. Well, not in the Senate. Senator Harkin's bill, when he wanted to come to the floor with funding at $164 billion, a slight increase from last year. There is a 42% difference between the House and the Senate Labor HHS bill, $164 billion to $122 billion. I want Senator Harkin to be able to bring his bill to the floor, debate it. Do you want an NIH? Let's fund it. Do you want a Center for Disease Control, which is in the state of Georgia, two excellent senators from Georgia? Then fund it. Let's debate. Let's discuss. Let's amend. Harkin can't even get it to the floor. And over there in the House, they can't move it either because the Funding for Health and Human Services, Education, and the Department of Labor is at a 2003 level. So while they want to send us an individual bill an, for an individual agency, an HHS and so on, as desirable as it is, I want to reopen government. That's what the Senate bill is, and I want to reopen negotiation. I would like to return to a regular order where using the parliamentary tools, tactics, and even tricks cannot delay bringing the bill to the floor. Since 2007, Senator Harkin could not bring a bill to the floor for an open debate, unfettered by filibuster, to be able to discuss this. So this is what this is all about. This isn't about numbers. This isn't about wonky. This is about meeting compelling human need. In the Labor HHS subcommittee, we fund NIH, the Center for Disease Control, the Social Security Administration, Mining Safety, Department of Education. This is what we should be working on. In education, the money for the disabled, et cetera. So, Mr. President, I come to the floor again as the chair of the Appropriations Committee. I am proud of the work my subcommittee chairman have done in getting bills ready to come to the floor for debate and follow regular order. I so appreciate the cooperation that we've received from the other side of the aisle in our committee. It's been a great sense of cooperation. Dispute and disagreement on funding levels and even matters of policy. But I had an open amendment process. Everybody had their say. Everybody had their day. We were moved the bills forward. We are. That's called regular order. That's called democracy. Everybody has their day and everybody has their say. But let's move it on. So let's reopen government. Let's have a true negotiation. And I would hope that the, out of the 5.30 meeting would come a path forward, but we have one now. Pass the Senate resolution in the House, come back, and let's get the work of the United States Senate, the United States government, uh, really going again. Uh, Mr. President, I yield the floor. <clears throat> Mr. President. Senator from Wyoming. 